Good afternoon, members of parliament, support, no, support staff, yes, support staff, radio listeners, TV viewers, and members of the media. Welcome to this Central Committee meeting of number 29 of today, Monday, May 16, 2028. We have established a quorum of 12 members. Please let's stand for a moment of silence. I've received notice of absence from MP William Marlin and MP Sarah Westcott Williams. Is there any member of parliament that wish to have the floor for notifications before we begin? I see no need. Then we go over to our one agenda point for today, which is the proposed kingdom law containing the rules reg regarding the establishment of the Caribbean body for reform and development. The kingdom law Caribbean body for reform and development. This can be found on the IS 547, Parliamentary 2021 2022, dated February 11, 2022. We go over to the agenda point. The proposed Kingdom law containing rules regarding the establishment of the Caribbean Body for Reform and Development, the so called Kingdom Law Caribbean Body for Reform and Development. On February 11, 2022, Parliament received the proposed draft Kingdom Law Caribbean Body for Reform and Development for consideration from the Governor. The proposed Kingdom Coho Law was received on February 11 and registered under IS 547 Parliamentary 2021 2022. The following the draft cons consensus Kingdom Law states that. The government of the Netherlands, Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin, having, a well -being, having the well-being of the population of Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin, would like to consider working together to implement the following. Reforms of administrative nature, achieving sustainable and public finances, and strengthening the resilience of the country, of the, of the economy of these countries. This is connected with the absorbing, this is connected with absorbing the economic contraction, sorry, due to the COVID-19 crisis. It is also desirable that the Netherlands temporarily makes liquidity support available to Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin, and that the government of the Netherlands, Aruba, and Curaçao, and St. Martin have agreed that in accordance with Article 38, second paragraph of the Charter of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, an administrative body with independent tasks and powers be established and that will provide support. This document with this information, as stated before, registered on the 547, IS 547, dated February 11, and can be found on the P drive. To which member of parliament do I give the floor to ask questions or Make statements. Yes. <laughs> MP Gums, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to you, my colleagues, uh, Rifir, um, to those joining us online and via different mediums. Uh, Madam Chair, we, the PFP faction submitted its official position paper on the draft uh, Coho Consensus Kingdom Law, um, which was also copy to the parliaments of Aruba and Curaçao, as well as the Erste and Twitter Camera of the Netherlands. Um, as our first official position paper, we provided it as well for public viewing and uh, perusal via our website. It's a position that some may not agree with, but I am quite proud of the fact that we at least provided one. There's been a lot of uh, unclear discussion and there's a lack of clarity in general for us as a faction, which I believe is shared through my discussions anyway at IPCO with many of my colleagues in the other countries within the kingdom, not just from a legislative perspective, but from a sense of where is the ownership for St. Martin in this consensus kingdom law and indeed in the coho entity as a whole. We've provided two different options uh, that we believe could make it more palatable for the parliament of St. Martin, Aruba and Curaçao with regards to the coho entity and the law in itself. 
um, as well as a little more radical option uh, clearly explained that would see us prolonging our engagement with the World Bank. Of course, taking into consideration that the World Bank's real uh, job is long-term structural reform and project management and execution. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this was, of course, provided uh, to the Airste and Twitter camera. And so for us, as a faction, I believe, it would be uh, our desire to hear the opinion then of the Dutch government with regards to the position paper. So that would be my question. If we could receive some official feedback regarding the PFP position paper, which was indeed provided to all uh, interested and relevant parties um, from the Dutch government then, and as well as the Airste and Twitter camera, uh, just their thoughts on what it is. Is it an option? Is it something that they can see themselves in? Because I think that some of the, the bits that we provide, building capacity for our country, looking not just at government, but our government-owned companies, allowing for training sessions and development, uh, engagement with the Klingendal Institute and collaboration with the University of St. Martin, for example. I think that this is the way that we actually take ownership and thus build accountability for the reform projects that are currently going to be um, executed. So that would be the one question that I would have with regards to uh, the position that we've presented um, for this uh, uh, COHO draft law. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Gums. Is there any member of parliament that wish to have the floor? MP Rolanda Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and a good afternoon to you once again, to my colleague members of parliament, and to the viewing public. Good afternoon. Madam Chair, the, the word trajectory has been popularized very much by this parliament. And that was because from the onset when we started this journey, I would say, where we were told or informed by the government that something is coming. It continued to involve, whether it was the Che, the Cre, Coho 1.0, Coho 2.0, etc. It became clear that the intentions from the Dutch government was to tie liquidity support in the need of a pan during the, a, a moment of need during a global pandemic, not caused by ourselves or by any of the countries within the kingdom, but by a global catastrophe. At that moment was where the birth of the coho was said to be. However, Madam Chair, it has been become apparent even since then that perhaps this was something much longer in the making. And before going into the coho itself, I would like to start to ask the question to, by means of this report on behalf of the UP faction, when did the Dutch government begin to feel or believe that there was need to tie liquidity support to reforms for the country? And did the Dutch government, who has proposed this law, let us be clear, this did not come from St. Martin or Curacao or Aruba. It came on proposal from them. Before 2010, knowing that these countries were going to be countries, where was the, de the, the demand from the Dutch government to provide such reforms? As I go through this presentation, Madam Chair, I think it will become clear why this is very important. Because we have to question, and one of the central questions at IPCO has been, are reforms for a developing country, when I say developing from the perspective of being a new country, are reforms the responsibility of the former, former colonial master, the people that have colonized you at one point and have decided correctly that autonomy should be given to those people, but wherein lies the responsibility to provide it? Does that responsibility lie with the person who has been released into the open, and then we say goodbye. And at some point, should we not f know full well that these countries would have needed such reforms and such support? So again, when can we, can the Dutch government identify the genesis of some sort of reform entity? Madam Chair, as we went through this trajectory, Another important thing that became clear where the Parliament of St. Martin had to step in was by means of various motions to, consist, to, to constantly remind the government of one, its limitations in this negotiation, 
but also a sort of blessing to be able to continue to negotiate to the best of their ability as long as they do not trample on local, kingdom, and international laws. Madam Chair, with that assignment, the government went forward and did a negotiation, as they called it, to the best of their ability, and came to this parliament and presented what they thought was the best of their ability, but some of the concerns that were there. And it was in that meeting that it was made very clear by the prime minister of the country that the consensus that was reached was reached under duress and under pressure. So a second question from our faction would be, can the government indicate in any way at all, or would, let me rephrase, would the Dutch government be able to comment on any semblance of pressure or duress put on the prime ministers of the country, in particular the prime minister of St. Martin, to accept the coho as is, with only minor changes to, for example, the Memori van Toelichting, due to the fact that they were in need of liquidity support. Madam Chair, I need to plug in my laptop. Should I give you a five minute? Uh, just one minute. Oh, no problem. Thank you. With that second question on the way, we continue to the trajectory that has led now to the parliament having this. And even then, I would like to know the position of the Dutch government on the fact that a date was set by the second chamber for reports to be submitted that might not imply that we must submit by their chosen date, which was originally May 13th, but then came to May 20th, but does the Dutch government agree that the parliaments of the country should have been given, if not as much time as they have had to negotiate such a coho, which was a total of 21 months, but at least sufficient time to be able to formulate and do all the necessary due diligences to test the coho? Particularly, Madam Chair, while the parliament has done its best to hear from experts to hear from local and others that have given us in, uh, indications of where it stands, from our High Council, from the SAD, et cetera, one test that would definitely take much more time and much more due diligence would be a test of whether the COHO complies with, with international regulations, European regulations as well. Does, is the Dutch government of the opinion, Madam Chair, that more time should be given to test that aspect? And to what extent do they believe that the COHO has been tested towards its compliance with international law? Now, Madam Chair, I think a lot over the time has been said with regards to maybe why the parliament, in one thing that we see almost unanimously across the board, not to speak on behalf of my colleague members, but if I can summarize the feeling or the sentiment I get is that no one feels that the coho as is, is acceptable. But if that is the case, some might interpret that unanimousness as we are collectively against something that might potentially be good for St. Martin. Well, Madam Chair, I think it's important to give some very prudent and perhaps practical examples where I believe that the coho can negatively affect our country. Madam Chair, the ability for the COHO to function as per the law is stated in the various early articles based on its makeup. Madam Chair, while it is implied in the legislation that the governments can collectively with the COHO come up with the country packages, it does not address the fact that the same semblance of collective consensus that brought the COHO in the first place, how do we know that semblance of pressure of, dur of duress will not exist in a coho mechanism that would be in place by means of a kingdom law. What I mean by that is this, and I would like to use an example. Let us say that the Dutch government is of the opinion that St. Martin should, in so should uh, sorry, the coho is of the opinion that St. Martin, in order to progress and finance its reforms, should include a property tax. 
Let us imagine that the technocrats then have the discussion as they've had before and try to come to an agreement to include this into a country package. Let us imagine that our local technocrats understanding the damage and danger that a property tax would do for St. Martin would give the resistance to those technocrats and say, no, this is not something that St. Martin can find itself in. Those technocrats then go to the COHO organization and then inform the Minister of the Interior that St. Martin has an issue with the implementation of a property tax. What happens if a conversation then happens between the Minister of the Interior, represented by the State Secretary and our Prime Minister, basically to the effect saying that if you all do not include property tax in the country package, liquidity support that you need will stop or the current reforms you're already working on will cease to continue, and we will call back our technical experts, we will stop the financing. Once again, would we be in a position where our government is under duress to include something in a country package? But this is where the coho is worse, because at this point, we have a prime minister that is able to bring that to parliament, state that sentiment, and a parliament can resist as a sort of last line of defense draft position papers, send special delegates, and make an effort to stop this from happening. But the minute we have agreed to this, it will be said at that point, but Parliament of St. Martin, you gave consensus. You agreed to this. Afsprak is afsprak. So stick to what you agreed to before. That is a key difference that I want the public and all of us to understand between the current situation and having a legal document drafted and called a consensus kingdom law, where our power to be able to say no and support our government and say, no, you shall not include property tax in a, in a, in a country package because we will not include such initiatives to finance the development of a property tax structure or a property tax collection agency, et cetera, et cetera, by means of our budgetary right. In the structure of a coho as we see it, as our faction sees it, as many of us have spoken about the property tax, we know that it is not good for St. Martin. The question will be, what undue pressure will the coho, while not implicitly by law, but by means of the powers grant to it, granted to it indirectly, cause even us as members of parliament to sit with a prime minister across from us or a minister from Vrami across from us bringing legislation to in introduce a property tax under the threat that if you don't pass this law, your teachers will no longer get paid. You will not get the necessary means you need to fix the dump, collect garbage, etc. What pressure does that put on the individual member of parliament's right? The oath that you say you have not received anything in exchange for your vote. Can that constitutionally written oath, even in of, of itself to the king of the Netherlands, is that now being replaced that we have received a coho in exchange for our vote in this parliament? Madam Chair, property tax is just one example. We have examples of members of parliament that when we are on the street or when we hear from people or on Facebook and they have an issue that they want us to address, are we to tell our elected public that we cannot amend a law because that's not in line with what the COHO wants? Or we cannot amend a budget to save, for example, Turning Point as we've done in the past because that is not the priority listed by the COHO? And does the government understand that simply saying that the government is the one that sort of stems in to the country package, so they have agreed to it, so parliament, you should follow what your government agrees. Does the government recognize that the pressure placed on us in the past does not give members of parliament the confidence to believe that such pressure will not exist in the future? Madam Chair, I believe a lot of these laws that we have with us today, when they were written, by those that put them together. We had a constitutional affairs department. We had many experts, local experts that weighed in. And when they wrote the statute, and when they wrote things like the CFT laws and all of these different laws, I can imagine they thought at the time that this was a good thing for St. Martin. I don't think we had any local people back then writing a law thinking that it would be applied in the way that it is being applied today. And members of parliament, in trying to say whether we are for this kingdom law or not, 
also have to imagine, even as written, and even if the technical experts describe it in a very technical manner, what is the way that it will actually be implemented and imposed on St. Martin? Madam Chair, I would like to also highlight a few of the technical concerns that have been raised by various others, but for the record that the, that the UP's faction's concerns are listed, I would still like to list them once again today. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll have to come back to that point because I have a, doc I have a little technical. Madam Chair, can I request just one minute to fix an issue? One of my documents is I'll not I'll just open. take a, a five minute adjournment. I would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned for five minutes.
Welcome back, members of parliament. We just had to take a brief adjournment to allow MP Bryson the opportunity to get his laptop in order. <laughs> MP Bryson, I would like to now turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence in allowing me to get everything uh, back on track with my laptop. Um, Madam Chair, as I was saying, my, my next part of the presentation is kind of to go over more on the aspects of the law itself, so kind of an article-by-article article review of where some concerns and questions still lie. The first part is with regards to Article 2 and the fact that um, this entity that is designed to actually do primarily reforms within the countries is not based in any of the countries. Article 2 states that it is based in The Hague, and it further states that it is a that it is based on the Dutch laws, the Kaderwetselfstandige Bestuur Organen, and I would like to understand where, why was this chosen as opposed to an entity to be established within any of the countries, or perhaps a joint entity across the three islands. Looking forward towards Article 5, one of the concerns we have here, how far does the Article 5 Section 2, to what ex why were these uh, from A through H identified as the, the aspects? And to what extent does the Dutch government feel that some should be priorities over others? There seems to be a feeling in St. Martin, among many people, myself included, that it feels as if the primary areas where they believe reforms should be are within the judicial and financial areas. However, Madam Chair, while I do agree there is a need for much judicial and financial reform, it is interesting to see that the Landspaketten, as presented to us, prioritize much less on the needs of, for example, housing, uh, healthcare, social aid, etc. To what extent should the COHO maybe focus? To what extent is the cohort designed to focus mostly on the financial and judicial reforms necessary within the country, as opposed to perhaps shoring up our ability to provide more housing, better health care, etc.? Madam Chair, the following point is also something that has been noted by the Council of Advice, and that has to do with the budget rights of the parliaments of St. Martin. Now, much has been said in terms of the replies that the Dutch government has given to the government itself in terms of a, let's say, legal budgetary right, whether that is surpassed or not. My line of questioning or concern is not so much to do with the legal language used for the budget right, but rather the implied budgetary concern. When we pose a question to the prime minister as to what the, concern, what the consequences could be for the Parliament of St. Martin, if it was not to approve, for example, a piece of legislation or a national budget or national budget amendment that is, on, that is designed to execute a reform from the COHO, the answer we received is that no, we cannot be forced to vote a certain way. However, there could be consequences on the country in the form of instructions. Madam Chair, this is what I refer to as not a legal usurping of our budgetary or legal right to amend laws or to pass laws, but an implied one. Because it obviously states that if Parliament does not do what the COHO wants, instructions are the order of the day. And that is not something that is democratic. A democratic society does, does not... Um, our democracy is not built on following instructions. Our democracy is built on following the will of the people. Only they should be able to instruct St. Martin, and they have given a mandate to a particular majority to do something. It is that majority that is ruling and should be able to clear the mandate as parliament for what we pass and what we don't pass. Having that instruction over our head, are they not of, do they not share the opinion that this can be seen as an implied usurping of our budgetary and legislative right as parliament? <laughs> Madam Chair, within the 
Coho legislation as well. One of the things that I do not see, and it is very unfortunate that this has not been center stage, is the strengthening of our own existing structures and high councils, namely the SER, the Ombudsman, Audit Chamber, Radvan Advis, etc. There have even been proposals at previous IPCOs to, for example, in, in create a Bukhrotings camera, so a sort of long-term replacement to the CFT that would act as a locally appointed entity that would oversee the government's budgetary management. So rather than the general audit chamber that more audits the government after fact, we would have a Bukhrotings camera, a budgetary chamber that would be locally appointed within each jurisdiction that would then be able to act as the CFT does now to give advice on what the budget should look like and then to also advise the parliament on what we should consider when passing a budget. Why is it that the COHO does not seem to address or look towards anywhere within the Memorie van Toe lifting of this law mentioning the need to strengthen our own institutions? Also, with regards to the strengthening of our institutions, our institutions are actually built on the capacity that we have within the civil service. And I don't see much attention on that aspect as well. So my question would be then, what is the intentions of the Dutch government to be able to address if the COHO becomes a reality? What will be the plan for actually building the capacity within the government and also the parliament? And has consideration been given for the fact that the Parliament of St. Martin in and of itself will also have an additional need for capacity and workload if the intention is to completely, uh, if the intention is to be able to deal with much more legislative action coming out from the COHO via the government? Madam Chair, also related to the capacity that we have and what we see, despite the low capacity, Madam Chair, it has become clear that the most recent reports provided to the Parliament have shown a 92% execution rate in terms of the reforms and the different activities that have been agreed upon within the country packages, that 92% of them that we have had a rate of 92% in terms of being able to either be on time, on schedule, or already completed. This lends an impression that the system as we have right now and the efforts already being conducted by the government are already working. So the question is, is there really a need from a COHO, in hindsight, looking at at least St. Martin's ability to stick to its agreements and for the Parliament of St. Martin to actually do what we say we would do in terms of passing various laws that are related to reforms. Has the Dutch government considered the fact that previous structures that have been put in place have not exactly worked out the way we have, we have planned? We have seen that the World Bank slash steering committee slash NRPB structure has not worked out the way we have hoped. Much of the money is still tied up and has not actually been spent. But at the time, then too, we were told, don't worry, pass this law, pass the NRPB, and we will see half a, mil half a billion dollars of investments going through the, the country. What we've actually seen is that significantly less than that has actually passed. What assurances would we or the public of St. Martin have that the COHO would not be just such another entity, one that seems to work on paper but doesn't actually work in practice? Madam Chair, I would like for the next part to go over and actually start by thanking the Social Economic Council uh, on request of the Parliament have answered some questions and gone, I think, very much in depth in some of the concerns that they have shared. And I think it would be important for the purpose of this report to highlight some of what their findings are because much of it, the national, sorry, the UP faction can definitely find ourselves in. First of all, I would like to go to something that, and maybe that's where National Alliance come to mind because one of the major points that they have, that they have addressed within their advice has to do with national debt. 
And we all know the motion that was presented and passed unanimously by National Alliance MP George Pantaflet with regards to the need to really put debt cancellation at the forefront. I would like to quote a section from the Social Economic Council's report on page six. National debt. The draft law cohort does not provide any legal basis for obligating either country to amend existing financial agreement as it pertains to existing loans. Therefore, the pending draft COHO law will not affect the existing debt situation regarding the national budget of country St. Martin insofar no additional liquidity support is provided. Madam Chair, when I read that statement, it shows almost as if, especially the last part, where it is very clear, insofar no additional liquidity support is provided, is that the COHO has no responsibility to actually address the pending and growing debt situation that the country has itself in. During the IPCO, I highlighted the fact that much of our debt was actually amassed at the, in, let's say, at the start of 101010 due to the Netherlands Antilles. After that, there was approximately 600 million, which amounted to an average of about 45 million a year in investments for the country, which to me are very normal. You are a new country, you need new investments, so no illicit debt or any example to say, boy, they have racked up such a terrible debt. This is debt that has been accumulated as a result of the need to improve our country, which is normal for any new country. And then the final part of the debt, the, of the bulk of the debt that we have now, are either related to Hurricane Irma or related to the pandemic. So it is very concerning that although something is so important, so ballooning, and so much that should be at the forefront of um, the discussions to improve the financial viability of St. Martin, the COHO does not take the debt situation of the country in the forefront. On the contrary, what the COHO speaks of is Leningen and more Leningen. These loans will not serve to actually improve our financial picture. These loans, even if they are to be written, in, written off one day, even if they are at 0% interest, they still appear on the books of St. Martin as a country. And every year we get our Moody reports and we don't see an improvement in our rating. We see a lowering rating, citing mostly our debt to GDP ratio as a reason for why our rating has been dropped. So Madam Chair, my question then is, why was debt cancellation not at the forefront in the conception of a coho entity, understanding the debt of not just St. Martin, but Curacao and, and, and Aruba? especially in our case where we have dealt with a hurricane and then a pandemic, why was the debt not taken into account in drafting such a piece of legislation? One would think that an entity that is built to help St. Martin would say we cannot put more debt on this country because that certainly would not help. Why is a structure of using grants not used instead of a structure that is built mostly on loans? Also, um, also citing from the also from the said report now on page five of this report, they have highlighted various uh, tranches of liquidity support that the country has received since 2019. When you look at the total Gilder amount, this has now amounted to 292 million uh, Antillian Gilders, or 141.7 million euros. The fact that liquidity support is now on the books of country St. Martin has not put us in a better financial position, but a worse one. The fact that these, this liquidity support was never given as a grant, or at least as a conditional grant, or at least as loans with a very clear condition for debt forgiveness is very concerning. The fact that since the idea of a coho came into place, the liquidity support was given as loans does give the impression that this will become the norm of the day for the coho. The coho will continue to be an entity that provides loans. These loans will continue to put St. Martin in a worse situation. And then the question has to be asked, does the Dutch government not feel any sort of obligation at all 
to provide support to St. Martin, a new country within the kingdom, a country that has gone through economic and natural disaster situations. Does the Dutch government not feel that any of the support to be provided by St. Martin should be done as a grant because it is due to us as a country as opposed to plunging the country further into debt? The liquidity support versus implementation of reforms. And this, this section is especially interesting. Because I would quote here, the said understands that in analyzing the draft kingdom coho law, the Netherlands is obligated to provide financial assistance through liquidity support directly or indirectly through the coho entity. However, the SER notes that as, as the terms dictating the scope, nature, and amount of the liquidity support are still to be established by contract, the right to financial assistance to St. Martin becomes unclear. My question would be, why not in a, in a law that is designed to provide support be very clear about the conditions that those loans should be for? As you have seen, even the SER has noticed, having such an ambiguity really doesn't create a situation where we know what we are walking into as a country. Furthermore, to quote some more, furthermore, the SER notes that liquidity support in times of need should solely be considered, solely be considered funds necessary to co cover expenses arising due to national emergencies, such as the pandemic, granted to keep the, co the government operational. Madam Chair, it is clear that when the government is asking for liquidity support, it is not for something that is new, and it's something that is for projects. It is something that should be for an emergency situation. So also to the government, why has not consideration been made to create a separate way for handling liquidity support outside of the coho instead of tying that directly to one entity that deals both with reforms and liquidity? Madam Chair, that becomes a central point of contention um, that I have re regarding coho. It seems to me, and I can come to no other conclusion, especially after IPCO, that the reason for including liquidity support is because they feel that they need a sort of tool, a sort of, of, of whip to use against both the parliaments and the governments of these countries in the event they don't feel reforms are going the way they think it should. That would be the only logical reason I can see why liquidity support is tied. So then the question would be, does the government have some sort of merit where they feel like, yes, if they were to be honest with us, yes, St. Martin, the reason why we are tying liquidity support to reforms is because we feel that if we don't do that, you will not comply. So therefore, has other considerations maybe not been made by the Dutch government? For example, when the reform, let's say liquidity was not tied to uh, reforms and reforms were handled independently, why has consideration not been given to give a kind of a tiered system or a tranche system of supporting reforms. So if St. Martin has particular reforms that we want to achieve, instead of sort of punishing us with liquidity support, simply state that government, I'm not going to be able to continue to fix that particular prison project if you don't also deal with your tax situation. Or government, I'm not going to continue with that reform in building an additional school or housing projects if you don't also address your, ga your gaming board situation. That would be a sort of a reform for reform situation that you can kind of understand. But using the liquidity support as a tool to try to force reforms down our throat is not something that I think is fair and that should be received by this parliament or government at all. I would like to summarize some of the, as we call it, the pain printing or the key uh, areas of concern for this report as follows. Firstly, our concern, our major concern, is that the current draft law has not been proven to be in compliance with international law, and in particular the UN Charter and resolutions related to St. Martin Martin's, Martin's right to a full measure of self-government. The fact that an entity under the authority of the Dutch government interferes with the autonomy of St. Martin's parliament and government alone is a violation of international law. And I know, Madam Chair, Lady, I, ex I expect that you will probably be able to have some additional questions in that regard. 
None of the previous two, none of the previous structures proposed slash implemented by the Dutch government have proven to function. Three, the COHO does not provide for the capacity building required for the execution of reforms desired by St. Martin. It is not seen as necessary. We have a concern about setting up a complex agency to execute things that our government has proven to be able to execute without a COHO at a rate of 92%. It can be seen as, quote, killing a mosquito with a sledgehammer. And five, while not direct, there is certainly a strongly implied pressure placed on the individual members of Parliament's budgetary right. Example, an MP hears a cries in the community to help a local orphanage. This orphanage is in need of 100,000 guilders that to keep dozens of children off the street. The MP who tries to amend a coho-related item that is deemed not as urgent or time sensitive, even with the support of parliament, risks the country getting an instruction as a result of his or her amendment. Madam Chair, a general point that I also think needs to be brought to the attention of the Dutch government as well, and also to the government of St. Martin. We have asked, and I have asked in writing, um, but also publicly, for the all documents related to the COHO to be provided to the public and this parliament in English. To date, unfortunately, that has not been the case. Now, in the case of the government, some things that have been stated is the lack of capacity and so on to be able to provide such op official translations. But I don't think capacity is an excuse for the large entity that is the kingdom government of the Netherlands. And while promises were made, even by the State Secretary in our visit, that the COHO would have been provided in English, to date, having checked the website of the Dutch government, there is still no COHO available in English. For that matter, even Papimento, another constitutional language recognized within the kingdom, has also not been provided. I think this is not the right way to work. We already have these situations within our judicial system where we have a predominantly Dutch judicial system that disadvantages the average citizen. But now, in a community that is reading about the coho every other day in the newspaper, must only rely on that to get their information on the coho. They can't actually just read it for themselves in their native language. And that is a big concern. I would like to ask the kingdom government, why no consideration, being that this is a law that is designed for us and for Aruba and Curacao, why was this not simultaneously sent out as a law provided, okay, officially in Dutch, but simultaneously, at least on the website, a PDF of all documentation, or rather a folder with various PDFs, PDFs of all information in both English and Papimento for our brothers and sisters in Aruba and Curaçao? I think that is something that the Dutch government definitely needs to address, and also in future kingdom laws, especially when they have an effect on the people of St. Martin, they should be provided in English. Madam Chair, in summary, you've heard some of the concerns from our faction. The, we have other members of parliament who will be able to air those concerns from our faction, let's say, during uh, the further handling of this report. I think we've been able to summarize quite the main concerns as well. I would also like to note, Madam Chair, that we received the Raad van Advies advice on the note of unwaisiging of the, of, of the law. Uh, I believe we received that on, on Thursday or Friday, if I'm not mistaken, and we are still going through that. So I may have some additional questions if they cannot be included in this meeting today that may, need to, that may stem from that actual advice on, in the meeting on Thursday. So I just want to at least give a heads up that that is a concern, uh, uh, sorry, that there may be some additional concerns stemming from the Council of Advices, uh, advice on the note of unwaisiging, the note of amendment that was done by the Dutch government. So I look forward to having some time to prove that one some more because that one was recently received. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, <clears throat> MP Bryson. Is there any other member of parliament that wish to have the floor? MP George Pantaflet, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to my colleagues. Good afternoon to the persons who are listening and those that are viewing. Madam Chair, my colleague before me really captured um, a lot of the points that 
other concerns and so on that I also had, and of course, I would not go into details anymore, but just to bring across a few points. Madam Chair, this, this issue of, the, of this um, draft coho, um, in my opinion, has been discussed extensively. Um, and the task for us now as parliament is to how do we, how do we change the narrative out there in the eye of the public as to why the objection, not only from Parliament and St. Martin, but also Aruban Carousel as to the, the, the manner in which this coho law, this draft law, has been placed on the table. Let me, do, let me use this term. Because, Madam Chair, the, the, the issue is that it is felt in the eyes of, of the public some or, or many, that there's an objection because it means that um, we would not be allowed to do as we please with regards to how things are taking place on the islands. And unfortunately, um, it is a challenge to, to try to change the minds of those when it comes to this matter. Madam Chair, Article 38 of the Charter is quite clear. Point one says that the countries, Aruba, Carousel, St. Martin, and the Netherlands, can enter into mutual agreements. Point two states that these agreements can be done, and here is where it becomes interesting, by kingdom laws or kingdom general measures. There's already an agreement, Madam Chair, between State Secretary and Prime Minister, let's say the governments of, of the Netherlands, and to the executing task of the temporary work group and the civil servants of St. Martin, Caruso, Ruben, and so on. With regards to the country packages, regards to the reforms that are already taking place. So, Madam Chair, during the IPCO meeting, we had the experts from the Netherlands, we had the experts from Ruba Caruso and St. Martin, who were explaining to us the technicalities of the Coho draft of the draft Coho law. And Madam Chair, I asked one question. One question I asked because, and I had to phrase it probably because I just wanted to make sure that the person who's going to answer the question understood exactly what I meant. I said that as we sat in a meeting during the IPCO, at present, the temporary work group, along with civil servants of St. Martin government and others, but let me stick to St. Martin, were busy executing the necessary reforms according to the country packages and so on, based on the agreement signed on Article 38 of the Charter. And as was said, I believe, on more than one occasion, and even by the Prime Minister, the Netherlands at the time was, since all these tasks are already being executing, executed based on agreement signed between the governments of the Netherlands and St. Martin, can you please tell me what's the difference between the draft coho law and the task already been executed 
by the temporary work group. And the response was, Madam Chair, I said in Dutch first, geen verschil. In other words, there is no difference. Absolutely no difference, Madam Chair. So this is why my question is, since what they want to do with the COHO is already being executed, then why do we need a COHO law? So Madam Chair, I, I will not prolong this matter anymore. We, we're gonna deal with it again sometime later on. But the key things are that St. Martin has to determine what her priorities are. I was in a work group that we had also during the IPCO, and one of the members of the second chamber said plainly, he said that they should not think, and he was talking about his colleagues in the Netherlands, they should not use the approach that one size fits all. Because all the countries are different, and then I inserted there, yes, indeed. And keep in mind that unlike our sisters of Urban Carousel, we are located in a hurricane belt. So therefore, the conditions or whatever you want to implement might be good for them, but not for us. And Madam Chair, in, in closing, I made it plain again in said meeting, if they want us to have what you call uh, financial independence, if, as one of my colleagues mentioned, regards to the debt to ratio GDP, the debt to the GDP ratio, if they want that to be what it was before, then the only option, Madam Chair, and I just heard that there's no legal basis for it, but I know that definitely we can pursue the matter. Debt cancellation for St. Martin is vital. I know Aruba and Carousel said they're willing to pay back their debt. That is fine with them. But St. Martin is saying, as a matter of fact, you owe us, we don't owe you. And debt cancellation is the way to start. So Madam Chair, yes, the draft coho law, a colleague of mine says totally against. And Madam Chair, to be honest, you know, as it is right now, I say totally against. But again, we have a meeting on Thursday and people will get exactly the final decision because as I said before, as long as I can't decide my future, then I will not have anyone else decide it for me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Pantaflat. I see next on the speaker's list, we have MP Christophe Emmanuel. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to everyone, Madam Chair. Lady, I had no intentions to speak at all concerning this issue because I believe my position is very well noted and clear amongst my colleagues, amongst the Dutch government, those in Holland, those in Curso Dose and Aruba. I listened to my colleague, MP Rolanda Bryson, and then also MP George Pantaplet, and I, I, I take the stance in terms of saying finally, because at least I can hear in the tone of MP Pantaflet when he said for him, his position is clear, which is no. And Madam Chair Lady, it's not often do I agree with most of what my colleague MP Bryson would say. But I listened to his deliberation and as much as it was long and winded in my opinion, I sort of want to help him because I get a sense that there's some sort of struggle in his tone. And Madam Chair, we can continue to play with it in its present form as it is right now when you look at this, but I have to agree Madam Chair, I have to agree that the coho, Madam Chair, can cause serious problems in governing this country. But Madam Chair, why, why, why is that? 
that at this present moment, the government of Sir Martin and Parliament of Sir Martin can't give a position. But Madam Chair, let me say this. Let me say this. Madam Chair, I could remember growing up and in the 80s and the 90s, Madam Chair Lady, what was grippling, how should I say, the community was drugs. And Nancy Reagan came out with a saying, when someone come to you with it, just say no. So if my colleagues are struggling, then look at the coho as drugs and just say no, Madam Chair Lady. But when you want to play with words in its present form, as it is right now, no, say it as it is and send that message, Madam Chair Lady, send that message. But is it because of fear? Is it because of fear? Then if that is the case, then stand behind your colleague, MP Pantaflet, and say, debt cancellation, debt cancellation. Take a position. Finally, Madam Chair Lady, take a stand to what you believe is best for St. Martin. But you can't leave the door open or just leave it crack a little bit and say, no to the cohort in its present form or as it is or as it's presented, you're still leaving the door open. Madam Chair Lady, the question is, what are we elected to do? So of course, when my colleague, M.B. Bryson, says he wants to ask those questions, the Dutch government could simply say, well, you haven't worked on anything. You haven't worked on the reforms. Nothing has been done. And no, it's not a law that was drafted for her. It's a Dutch law, Madam Chair. So it's not to, it's not to drag on. But again, the question is, what is the position of St. Martin concerning the coho? What is the position of the government of St. Martin concerning the coho? What is the position of parliament of St. Martin concerning the coho? In the Ipco meetings, Kiriso made their position clear. They made their position clear. The Prime Minister of Kiriso said he cannot get support of it from his parliament. At IPCO, the members of parliament of Kiriso said, no. No. So I can, I can understand, Madam Chair Lady, that the liquidity is a major issue. It's a major issue. But I get the sense that you're struggling in your deliberation. And we can go on with it. But I am saying, Madam Chair, there are so many things we can use to build up. But what is your position? You're a faction leader. That's why I say I take solace that now individuals are understanding, are uh, probably comprehending what I've been saying from day one. Just say no, Madam Chair Lady. And we deal with the consequences after that. We deal with the consequences after that. But Madam Chair, you can't want to have one foot in and one foot out. We can't play that game. This is a serious matter. It's a serious matter. Madam Chair Lady. So I am saying it's time for all of us to take a position. My position is clear. Member of Parliament, Jack Pantafet's position is clear. I would want to believe that even the chair lady's position is clear. Many would say she can't speak on behalf of Parliament. I had no problem with it whatsoever. You could have speak for me. Because that position was no. So what is the position of Parliament? What message are we really sending? Because this is a paper that will be sent to the government of the Dutch Kingdom. We are sending this. We want feedback. What is the position? What are we saying? What are we saying straightforward? What is your word? 
Madam Chair Lady. It has to mean something. It has to matter. Madam Chair, it has to matter directly. What message are we sending from Parliament? Madam Chair Lady. So again, to my colleague, if you're struggling because you don't want to directly say so because Chris has been saying it from day one, then take the stance of Nancy Reagan. Madam Chair, just say no. Thank you very much. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. Uh, I see next on the speakers list, we have MP Arundel. Would you like to have the floor? Well, good afternoon, everyone, Member of Parliament. Um, Chris, today, I side in with you, I agree with you. I go on after what you say. I agree with you. I'm not for the coho. I'm the independent member, Akim Arundel. I have sent my stance already in writing to the Crefield. Um That's basically I'm staying long. I'm not for the coho. Point and simple. That's all. Thank you, MP Arundel. Is there any other member of parliament that wish to have the floor? I see MP Brownbill. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Uh, Madam yes, um, Madam Chair, um, my opinion on the coho draft law is that certain amendments still sh could have been made, or at least to balance out the equality between all parties. I believe that the liquidity support for the Dutch Caribbean countries is very important to strengthen our economy at the same time. I also believe sometimes we must look at it from a community um, standpoint of Samaritan and not only from a political or business point of view because the community sees it, could see it in a different light than we see it. Not that I'm, I'm saying that the coho is, um, is good, but I'm just saying that from the lower standpoint, they could see it from a different point of view. For me, it's about the beneficiary of the benefits of the people of St. Martin for the economy to move forward and be strengthening. My only concern also was that there should be a, have an English version, which my MP um, Bryson said, which I was stressing from before, that there never was an English version put on the table so that it could be published and that everyone in St. Martin who, who cannot speak English, I mean, who, not can, who cannot speak Dutch, sorry, can also um, peruse it and understand it. So my only question would be, is what, what, what came about the rush of the coho and what came about the pressure of the coho and what came about the, the existence of the coho, knowing that we already had the, the trust fund on a table with the World Bank. Why, why, why wasn't that like continued or instead of going over to a whole new coho? So my question is, since I wasn't in parliament for those two years, what, what came about? Where did the coho really come from? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Brownville. Is there any member of parliament that wish to have the floor for questions? Then I see. Oh, okay, I see that I need to adjourn for five minutes, so I will adjourn this meeting briefly for five minutes. Meeting adjourned.
Members of Parliament, we just take a brief, brief, brief uh, adjournment, and we'd like to now continue with the uh, questions or statements regarding the draft law on COHO. And I see that MP, MP Arundel would like to have the floor. MP Arundel. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a statement, I forget to mention first. Um, I make a statement from a position with the paper. I would like it also to have a response of it, a response from them and all, from the position paper, and also it, may, it could be included into this, what we're doing right now, the, the report. Okay, thank you, MP Arundel. Then you would like for us to include your position paper with the report and have them weigh in as well on the um, your position, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay, then next we have MB Duncan. You have the floor. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to the SG. Good afternoon to my colleagues here in Parliament. And of course, a good afternoon to the people of St. Martin tuned in. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to be extremely brief. Uh, I too will state, just like my, my colleague MP uh, Pantoflet, that uh, this, this law to me is, is unacceptable as is. Um, I am also going to submit a position paper uh, as an alternative to COHO um, that I will submit on Thursday, and I also to request that it be attached to the report that will go to the Netherlands in the hopes that they will also respond to the position. I just want to say, Madam Chair, and a number of colleagues before me have echoed this sentiment, we are extremely vulnerable. And as much as we might share this uh, Dutch Caribbean, um, the issues that we face on St. Martin need to be uh, faced in a, in a very different manner. But what is more important to me is that a local uh, approach be established. And that is why there is a, a serious issue with the COHO as a Kingdom Act as is. Not only do we need legal technical assistance, we need capacity building, we need reforms that meet the demands, um, reforms that will help our people and this country to develop. And so to me there needs to be a local approach and so that is something that I will be presenting in the hopes that there will be a response from the Dutch government uh, on it. And so I thank you Madam Chair Lee. that's it for me. Thank you MB Duncan. Any other member of parliament wish to have the floor? I see MP Pantaflet. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that this uh, is a CC meeting, so you don't have the first and second round to speak, and then you say, well, you miss your turn. Um, I, I said in the, in the beginning, in my first um, deliberation, that I'm totally against the, the, um, the draft coho law, whatever you want to call it. Um, basically, I had three things that I definitely want to be taken up in, in, in the, the first slack when it's being submitted. Um, the two reasons why I, say, I said no. First and foremost, Madam Chair, it's a Dutch law. It's a Dutch law, that's number one. Secondly, the liquidity support is attached to it. And thirdly, Madam Chair, the jurisprudence is account to the Dutch legal system. So Madam Chair, the two questions I have, I want to get up in the report is number one, what is the difference between what the COHO is intended to do and what is being done right now by the technical work group, the temporary work group, because it is a proven fact that right now, without the COHO law, all the necessary tasks are being executed. And I think my last question, Madam Chair, will tie into the first one is, has the St. Martin government complied thus far with the agreements that have been signed between the government of St. Martin and the Dutch government in regards to the executing the task of the reforms and the country packages. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Pantaflet. I see that MP Gums would like to have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, just to elucidate, as suggested by some of my colleagues, on my previous question, just for the sake of the report, um, I would like a response from the Kingdom government, in particular the Minister of Bezetka, on the following critical points of the PFP position paper. So regarding the lack of financial clarity, we have the opinion that more information is needed regarding, of course, the monetary amount of the investment coming into the COHO and thus the projects from the Dutch government. This was something that was not really made clear to us even at IPCO um, and still remains unclear to this day. The flow of investment, whether it's 
actual funds or in-kind funds, that the project budgets, how are they going to be split between financial inflow from the Dutch government and or the country governments? And as well with what MP Bryson said, St. Martin's debt, much has been said about our current debt to the Netherlands. And while we as a faction understand that conversion to grants or full debt cancellation will require itself uh, sort of a give and take scenario, we believe that meeting reform deadlines and milestones should entitle the country to certain conversion or debt removal targets. I would also, we would also ask for a response from the Kingdom government regarding the legislative concerns portion of our paper, which explains our concerns with the articles of the Kadawet ZBO that will be applicable to the COHO, namely Article 8, 9, 11, 13, Articles 18 up to and including Article 30 and Article 41. Further to this, our specific concerns regarding specific articles in the COHO draft law itself, in particular Article 28, which highlights the glaring absence of functional dispute regulation, something that was also discussed at the IPCO, because for St. Martin, the only possibility to counter any disputes that may arise within the COHO is to go the route of Kronberoop, as per the Rijkswet CFT Articles 26 and 27. So this brings forth a lot of questions if this will serve the best interests of the country, as it is a very long trajectory uh, when you have an issue with whatever is um, occurring with the COHO. Article 6, Section 4, uh, which we actually uh, recommended uh, and believe should be removed uh, from the law itself, gives the Minister of Basic Care the ability to give the COHO an instruction about the agenda after consulting the Minister of General Affairs. As this has been a concern highlighted, it's only a consultation and does not require consent. So it means that the instruction cannot be stopped, it's just you're informed uh, as a courtesy. On paper, we understand it's meant to protect us if the COHO acts outside of the agreement set forth between the islands and the Netherlands, but it will function like a double-edged sword, and I believe it's being used as just a, a sort of loophole or a vang net so that the Netherlands can swiftly change something in the execution agenda without repercussion. And Article 4, Section 2, which seemed to contradict the COHO law itself, explains that the COHO cannot execute tasks that according to the Constitution would be the task of a local entity. Um, from a legal or logical perspective, it doesn't really jive well with what is intended because it prohibits the cohort, in our opinion, from doing exactly what it's being established to do. Uh, so it kind of negates the entire law. Further to that, I would like, uh, we would like the Kingdom government's response to option A of our position paper, which suggests changes to the coho, including a removal of the 12.5% cuts. Um, we believe that that is the one way that we can generate ownership and buy into the basic goals of the COHO. Uh, it will restore full benefits to civil servants, but also it will address something that I'm not sure was really considered um, by uh, the previous um, State Secretary then when presenting this option, which is how do we combat, uh, how do we build capacity when we're now combating brain drain at our government-owned entities? who are leaving these entities for private sector options that will offer them the salaries that they had previously become accustomed to. Uh, additionally, under option A was building capacity via the COHO by utilizing at-home trainings. I mentioned earlier uh, the Klingendal Institute in partnership with the University of St. Martin and tapping into the diaspora that exists in the Netherlands itself and elsewhere uh, where our young professionals and students who may have an interest in public service can be matched with critical vacancies, and this can be executed via the COHO and would help to build our sense of ownership uh, with the entity itself. And finally, a response from the Kingdom government regards to option B of the paper, which envisioned, as I mentioned, a new World Bank arrangement, including Curaçao and Aruba, with a general steering committee of new representatives for all four countries and the World Bank. If we look at the COHO, uh, it essentially kind of mimics that's set up already with a three-person board. Uh, there is a three-person steering committee. Uh, we envision a general steering committee of all the islands plus the Netherlands and the World Bank, and then thereafter the mini steer codes that will guide the specific country pro um, package projects and reforms. So if we could receive a response from the Kenyan government regarding those points, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, MP Gums, for your addition to the report. Uh, is there any other member of parliament that would like to speak on this topic? I see then that there's no need and I would like to just add a few more points to the report before we come to, uh, before we close this meeting. Members of parliament, as you are um, aware, this parliament having received a first draft 
CRE law from the Honorable Prime Minister on July 7, 2020 for a perusal, passed a motion on July 8, 2020. This resolution clearly establishes that the proper procedure for establishing a consensus kingdom law were not being followed by the Dutch government. The main resolution of this motion was that uh, any financing received from the Dutch government should be devoid of conditions that will trample on local or international laws and inflict a negative impact on the lives of the people of St. Martin. Then, on November 5th, 2020, this parliament also passed a motion which declared any actions, including proposals and legislative actions and initiatives by the government of the Netherlands, which do not treat the interests of the people of St. Martin as paramount and or violate the Netherlands' continued obligations under Article 73 of the UN Charter and St. Martin's unmandated right to a full measure of self-government based on an absolute equality with the Netherlands under the Kingdom Charter are null and void and therefore inoperative with immediate effect. Now, why did I mention those two motions? Those two motions are very important for us to, I would like to add it to our report for their perusal. And I will then direct my questions based on the basis of those two motions, where we stated clearly that the draft law should not trample on our constitutional, kingdom, and international laws. I would like to hear from the Dutch government what their take is, um, where I clearly see that the Koho law is indeed in contravention with the following laws and treaties. I'll start with our constitution, our local laws. Article 81, the applicable legal regulation in St. Martin's are the Charter of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the agreements with other, and B, the agreements with other powers and with organizations under international law insofar as they have been ratified in St. Martin. My question is, does the government consider the UN Charter to be an agreement, be an agreement with an organization under international law? And if, and if so, is the COHO not unlawfully based on Article 81 sub B of the Constitution of St. Martin if it is in violation of the UN Charter? My next question is based on the Kingdom Charter because I am again following the trajectory of the motions that we passed and tabled in, in this Parliament. And under the Kingdom Charter, I refer to Article 41. The Netherlands, Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin look after their own affairs independently. My question there is how can government reconcile the fact that the Minister of Bezaka will have the ultimate say regarding the COHO with Article 41 of the Kingdom Charter of the Netherlands, is my question. Then I base my question based on a treaty that I think is also in contravention. It is the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, and the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, ICESCR. Article 1 of this covenant says that all peoples have the right of self-determination by virtue that right they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. And the point 3 of that article, that um, the state's party to the present covenant, including those having responsibility for the administration of non-self-governing and trust territories shall promote the realization of the right of self-determination and shall respect that right in conformity with the provisions of Charter of the United Nations. My question is, is the government of the opinion that the trajectory and the content of the draft then Cre Che Coho, the law, has enabled and will continue to enable the people of St. Martin through their elected um, representative, rep representative to freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Additionally, the draft COHO law and the procedure with the government of the Netherlands follow to prepare it is it in contravention with um, paragraph 2.2 of the written statement of the Kingdom of the Netherlands as submitted in the International Court of Justice on February 27, 2018. Said paragraph says as follows, that 3.2 of that paragraph says, it is submitted that on the basis of these for formulations in international treaties and authoritative, or author, authoritative United Nations declaration, 
the right of the self-determination of the peoples relate to the determination of the political status of a people and the pursuit of its econ economic, social, and cultural development and future. And on the basis of these formation, it must also be concluded and that the decisions on the political status and the economic, social, and cultural developments are made by the people itself or its legitimate representative, not by others. More so, moreover, such decisions shall be made in full freedom without outside pressure and interference. Is the government of the opinion that this statement can be applied to the trajectory and the content of the draft Koho law? Lastly, the most infamous article of them all, Article 73. And I'll just read Article 73 A and B. A, to ensure that with due respect of, for the culture of the people concerned, their political, economic, social, and educational advancement, their treatment, and their protection against abuses. And then Article 73B, to develop self-government, to take, to develop self-government, to take the due account of the political aspirations of the people, and to assist them in the progressive development of their free political institution according to particular circumstances of each territory and its people and their varying stages of advancement. My question is, can the government indicate how the draft Koho law ensures that the provisions on the Article 73A and B are adhered to? With that, members of parliament, I will, that's my final question to this report. And if there's no other member of parliament again that wish to have the floor, then the report the report containing the questions and remarks will, um, will be created by, by Parliament. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, then we will um, move over to our next meeting on Thursday to ratify that report. And um, then we have come to the closing of this meeting. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your suggestions. This meeting is then closed. <laughs>